work hard to overcome the fear of failure. We gotta succeed. That kept us on the edge. I learned how to push back. I always thought there's got to be some way around the challenge. There's a way to do it. We can do it. I never give up. When I think of Jake, I, I think of a big old ship that's riding steady as she goes. <laughs> we grew up with him as one of our mentors, and um, when he speaks, we listen. East winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. I think of him as one of the first leaders of all of the organizations that we've created. The regional corporation, the borough assembly, city government, search and rescue, volunteer organizations, whaling captains organizations. He's the guy that they look to when times are tough. We were the fixer-upper guys, you know. I always call him Mr. Inside, Mr. Outside. We pushed like hell. How can he know so much? Know so much law, know so much strategy. To see how far we have come because of that steady leadership, that long-term vision. Look how much better have grown up. Remember when we built our house? Yes, it was all tundra out there. But now there's so many houses. Now we have about 4,500 people. During those days, your community involvement, you think it would lead to all this change they have now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Barrow is one of the communities on the North Slope. been around several thousand years. Growing up in Barrow was quite simple. We spend a lot of time out in the open country and not have to worry about when the next business meeting is going to take place. Back in the early days, as soon as school was out, my father and my mother would pack us up and take us down the coast or up inland, and we'd be out there till August when school was ready to start again. I would go out with a 22 rifle and look for ducks and birds and just kind of explore. My cousin Oliver and I, we had a little sled. I was probably in the fourth grade, and Jake was like in the first grade or something. And we were inseparable. We didn't have running water in those days, so we did a lot of dog teaming, hauling snow and ice. We thought it was fun. You ate and you went to bed, and you got up in the morning, the first thing you wanted to do was harness up your dogs and go. Oliver and I, that's two special dogs, we call them Jungle and Junior. We'd take them all over the place. Those were our two main dogs. Junior was mean. He growled at you every time you get close to him. But you learn to trick them, to put their own harnesses on. They um, came back one spring from boarding school and outside the yard was a, a snow machine. 
didn't see any dog. Well, they were all shot, basically. I mean, when the iron horse came in. See, the dogs ate more than you did. And they had to eat a lot to be strong and, and warm out in the cold. Those were great days when we had those two dogs. It was also difficult feeding the family at the same time. Change doesn't warn you. All of a sudden, it appears. That is something I often think about. How do we manage change? How we approach the solution to a conflict without necessarily having to change your culture. I guess it's a matter of advancing the quality of life for our people. Amen. On this special day. Another one back there. Now look at that celebration That's for the Eskimo world. Everybody's mine. welcome. Oh, today is the day we celebrate a successful whale hunt. Happy Nalukadak. Happy Nalukadak. <laughs> it's one of our cultural celebrations that everybody looks forward to. <laughs> welcome. And we start the day off with serving soup and bread. And then around 3 o'clock, they'll be serving the fermented quail meat. Then around 5 or 6, start serving the mukta, frozen whale meat, and other things. Here's your mukta, and then here's your meat. My mother always told me I was a school freak. <laughs> My parents weren't all that educated, but they felt that it was important for us kids to continue our education. I went to Wrangell Institute for one year. Sort of hard at first and be homesick a lot. Went to Mount Edgecombe High School. My senior year, I applied for University of Alaska Fairbanks and enrolled in electrical engineering. I had enough money to stay about three months. The decision time came around, it was either starve or go home. But that didn't stop me. <laughs> we started to get involved in local activities involving young people. The city got a grant to build a facility, and part of it was supposed to be a recreational center. But the city council had different ideas. The first thing we did was to organize the kids to stage a peaceful protest. And the next thing I knew, I was asked to fill a vacancy on the city council. Say goodbye to the world. Back in 1970-71, the Arctic Slope Native Association was working on the creation of the North Slope Baru. We were looking at the opportunities and the advantages of creating an area-wide governmental unit. We were looking at taking over education, taxation, planning and zoning as a tool to protect our subsistence way of life. We had a lot of opposition. Most came from the oil industry. The industry players were saying that we're not going to pay property taxes. We're not going to pay anything to the North Slope. 
Joe Pixon, he was the president of the Native Association. The leadership, they were talking about the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. We're in our mid-twenties. There weren't that many young people our age that were willing to get involved and participate. We learned to read a lot, and we were full of ideas. So we ran bingos to help them raise money for Washington, D.C. trips. Our guys needed funds. At that time, there's no larger smoking in the public places. <laughs> that you could see a cloud of smoke in the, in the bingo hall. Hell, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. But we made some money. I mean, it was something to advance the cause. We didn't have water and sewer systems. Uh, there were no clinics in our communities. Schools were run down. We were trying to get people to understand what the land claim was all about, what the creation of the North Loop would do for our people. There's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel for us. Been a whaling captain since 1977. Whaling is a traditional activity for the Eskimos. Been doing it for thousands of years. In 1977, the International Whaling Commission, under pressure from the environmental group, banned subsistence whaling without advising us until after it happened. Jacob is my older brother. When I was a little boy, I remember we had a moratorium. We had only, I think, three whales to land. Spent a lot of time traveling to D.C. trying to convince the government our whaling is not destroying the whale population. Jacob was one of the first chairmen for the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. He never gave up. And eventually, we proved the International Whaling Commission wrong. I heard about this guy that was studying the hibernating marmots. <laughs> we needed a scientist, so we called him in and hey, you want to start studying bowheads? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll come and work for you guys. I just need to talk to a few Eskimos. So we made him a forward whale scientist. <laughs> Sometimes before Christmas in 1976, my parents and one of my uncles invited my wife and I for dinner. And we look at each other and say, I wonder what they want to do. Maybe we've done something bad. Or we need to get some scolding. <laughs> anyway, we had dinner and finally the subject of whaling came up. And my dad looked at me and says, are you ready to take over? That was the high point in my life. Jake was a whaling captain by the time I knew him. Barrow is a long way from here, but many decisions are made here in Washington that affect the people on the North Slope of Alaska. The decisions were made about what lands on the North Slope should be put into federal reserves, national parks and wildlife refuges, development decisions before oil and gas, decisions about the use of the ocean. I have a considerable history working with Jake Adams and Arctic Slope Regional Corporation going back to the late 60s. Nobody knew anything about the Alaska Native people what the history was, what the economics of these villages were, what their claim to the land was, what the legality of that was. The passage of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act in 1971 was a unique experiment. Rather than creating reservations like in the lower 48, the Native Claims Settlement Act created corporate entities that would be encouraged to engage in economic development and commerce on behalf of the Native people. Initially, the oil companies wanted their things done their way or not done at all. They were in favor of the reservation system. Most people didn't want anything to do with it. 
And one of the biggest fears was, you know, this white man is coming and it's not going to stop coming. You're going to have to learn and beat them at their own games. That's what we set out to do. Oliver was the guy that dealt with the oil companies primarily and would go with them to the best restaurants and he'd help them spend a little bit of their money. But Jake, he would only have formal meetings with the oil companies where he had a stenographer and could keep them straight. He was uh, representing the Inupiat people and their culture. Oh, we had a strategy. Bad guy, good guy. We'd have a meeting and Jake would get up and stomp off. I would see if we could patch things up. Oliver could romance anybody, but Jake had no romance in him. He was just as hard-headed as he could be. And he was right. He wanted his people to be independent, to have their own company, and to be making their own decisions about what was important, what wasn't. And Jake never wavered in that. The Arctic Soap region was the only region in the state to stand up and fight against the land claim settlement because we as a people were coming at it from the perspective and the deep belief that we're giving up too much and receiving too little in return. And after it was enacted, we picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off, and created a corporation rooted in stalwart leadership and a progressive nature. The corporation was faced with the opportunity to select five and a half million acres, but right away it was told they couldn't have about half of the slope. There were some obstacles. But also so that it can be transmitted to the Secretary of the Interior and possibly used before Congress. So with that, we'll start. Mr. Chairman, I think before you start, I would like to uh, kind of tell them in their language of why you, are, why you people are here. One of the first things we did was to look at how our villages are going to get lands to meet their subsistence needs. The village people at that time were concerned about caribou, whales, ducks, and geese. That was their value of the land. The first witness was Jacob Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize many of our people not showing up. This is a very special time of the year when our people go on where. So it left it to ASRC to have this more scientifically informed view of what the values of the land were. What became clear very quickly was how smart Jake is and how much he understood of what needed to be done. The industry realized that they have to support the, the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act in order for them to get what they want. The Native organizations were tying up a lot of lands. Oil companies couldn't go on the lands at that time unless they had an active Native partner who had a claim to the lands. So we entered into several different exploration agreements to help us select lands that had good potential for oil and gas. That led to conflict, but it also uh, equipped the regional corporations with the ability to have the benefit of the oil industry's geologic information. The first 11 years, there was vice president of lands for the corporation. Then in 1983, I was elected president when I was first goal for us to become a billion dollar revenue corporation by 1990. But we achieved that in 1989. And Jake was the driving force that made those choices. Uh, and those choices are really what drove ultimately the initial success of ASRC. A news reporter for the Anchorage Daily News asked me, uh, why are you so interested in Working with the oil industry, don't you realize that someday they may destroy your way of life? And I looked at him and said, 
we're not going to watch the rest of the world go by. We're going to make the world work for us. We have been the landlord of the Arctic for a long time. We intend to stay here for a long time. Long after oil and gas is gone, and long after outsiders have left. Barrow or Kerovik is home. I'll always call this place home. I didn't understand or know much about our history growing up here. Um, when I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks, I took an EXA course and reading about Jacob Adams, Oliver Levitt, and then realizing like, wait a minute, they were our age, you know, in their 20s when they were doing all this stuff. I've always wanted to be a helicopter pilot. I learned it was very expensive, like very, very expensive. And so I looked for other ways, other resources to fund um, flight school, right? There was this uh, scholarship opportunity called the Jacob Adams Leadership Award. I applied for five years straight. It was 2008 that the Anari Leadership Award started a $20,000 scholarship to cover um, tuition, books, room and board. Jake is a very education and community-oriented family man. This is a basketball community. Are you just warming up, Jake? When I was in high school, I played center. And growing up, you know, we'd always see both Jacob Adams and Oliver Levitt, number one Barrow fans in the stands. Oh, you played center? Yeah. It, it really meant a lot to us growing up, them having that passion for wanting to see our kids succeed, whether it's through basketball or education. He has done a lot for our community. Great things come from people who are there to fight for what is ours. And, um, you know, I'm just grateful for Jacob Adams. Yay! All right. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I wish I was younger again. <laughs> I often think about that. If I was 35, I would do these kind of things again. <laughs> or should have solved that problem earlier. I really believe Jake's a true visionary for his people, where we sometimes would want things to happen in 30 minutes. The guy has the patience to wait 30 years if he had to. It's like if you worry too much, you don't accomplish anything. I'm always thinking about how do we get past that issue. He's sometimes outclassed individual professionals in each of their special areas of trade just by giving something good thought and review. I've seen Jake be a better geologist than geologists. I've seen him be a better lawyer than lawyers. I'm a curious person that likes to understand what makes things work. Jacob makes it look a little easier than it really is to do this walking in two worlds. Jacob has demonstrated it's not just walking in two worlds, it's being the best in both worlds. And it's been so important for all of us to recognize Jake's ability to see we are not victims of any circumstance. I think these days it's mostly the abuse of alcohol and drugs among our people that kind of makes me angry. We're able to overcome we're able to take ownership, we're able to be responsible. It's not always easy, but you have to keep plugging away. The Jacob Adams Leadership Award asks questions about how you give back to your community, and I wasn't really giving back. And so I started taking on more volunteer roles, I started getting more involved in the community, began getting more of a sense of what it was to do your civic duty. And on the fifth year, um, I got the scholarship, and it was a changing point in my life. You know, I think the word leader means helping your people, and that's who Jacob Adams is. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Tommy. How you been? All right. <laughs> oh, no. 
Bit Culture, we focus on teaching our younger generation the art of living the Inuit life. I think I have muck stick in my teeth. <laughs> One, two, three, go! <laughs> I was fortunate enough to learn from people like Oliver and Jake. And I started whaling when I was 10 years old, you know, and still to this day I'm 32 and I'm still learning things every day, you know, as we're out there, you know, current, ice conditions. What I learned from these gentlemen, you know, I'm going to definitely pass on to my kids and hopefully they pass it on to their kids, you know, keep this tradition alive, you know, keep on whaling. Congratulations, Jacob! Are we going to see this on TV?